certainly. Ready when you are. All right, so we've got uh, Christopher Nogibau, mm -hmm. and he'll be talking about five years of outreach and inclusion programs at PyCon Australia. Oh. Thank you very much for the uh, thank you very much for the welcome. Uh, before I start, I'm just going to note that I served on LCA 27, uh, 2016's uh, diversity program review team. Uh, things that I say that don't match up with how LCA 2016 did things, I don't intend as criticism or anything like that. Uh, different conferences do things differently, so. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how PyCon does stuff. Uh, so hi there, uh, I'm Chris, um, and yeah, hi Benno. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to bring more people to community run events. Uh, I'm not going to be sharing names of sponsors and stuff like that during the talk because we talk about uh, relationships with sponsors that continue over multiple years and may have stopped since then. Uh, we really appreciate the contribution of our sponsors, but we don't want to make you feel bad about the fact that they've left us uh, during the um, during the course of running this project, which has been quite long lived. Uh, so a bit about me, I'm an outgoing council member of Linux Australia, which is the organisation that uh, runs this here conference, as well as many others. Uh, they also issue uh, grants and uh, to worthy open source related projects throughout Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they also underwrite, uh, well, yeah, they underwrite events, including this one. I have been a fellow of the Python Software Foundation since 2013. And I, since about July last year, have been serving on the Python Software Foundation's uh, grants committee. Um, the PSF has, uh, is the organization that's held the copyright to the Python programming language for quite some time. Uh, in recent years, it's been a steward for the Python community as well uh, through running events such as PyCon US and also the outreach programs such as their grants program. Uh, I'm also the director of linux.conf.au 2017, this here conference. Uh, it's in Hobart next January. And I also don't expect LCA 2017 to do things exactly the same way as PyCon Australia has done things, even though I've been involved in both events. Uh, different conferences have different communities, and it's important that we cater to and grow those communities in ways that suit those individual communities. So a bit more about me, I'm also extremely privileged. Uh, if you were to nominate a whole bunch of categories of privilege, you would probably find I fit into most of them, um, which should make it seem pretty odd to you that I'm here giving a talk that is on the face of it about diversity. Um, so this talk is not about diversity in tech. Uh, I don't believe this is an open question. We're not doing a very good job of it. We need to do better. This talk is about ways we can go about doing that. Uh, there are people far more credible than me who can provide evidence that diversity is a thing that needs to be worked on in the open source community. So my expertise is in running events for the open source community. Uh, this talk is about running programs that can help lead to increased diversity at events. So when I talk about out outreach and inclusion, I'm talking about outreach, which is what we do to find and encourage people who wouldn't otherwise have attended events. And inclusion is what we do to make sure that everyone who attends these events feels welcome. And this talk is primarily going to be looking at running funding programs. Uh, these might be referred to as, for example, uh, diversity scholarships, diversity grants, uh, opportunity grants. Uh, in PyCon Australia and PyCon US, we call this financial aid. Um, so for events, running um, funding programs can come in in forms. The simplest is uh, just giving away tickets to people who are underrepresented. Uh, at the higher end and more difficult to organize uh, scale of this, it can extend to paying for travel and lodging expenses to people who can't afford it. So why are we focusing on events uh, like conferences such as this one, such as, as PyCon Australia? So our community, the open source free software community, uh, is one that primarily conducts itself over the internet in sort of a non-face-to-face -face sort of context. Uh, we, can, uh, we communicate over mailing lists, we communicate over issue trackers, over IRC, stuff like that. So for, for new people who come to open source, it means that you, you don't tend to have face time with the people that you're actually working with. This might be a, a very unfamiliar way of working if you're new to open source. It means adapting to a form of guidance you might not be used to. And yet, even though most of what open source does is, is communicating over the internet, you're all at this conference here. You've come uh, to an open source event to meet people within your community. Conferences are really the best way we have to meet people uh, and be inspired by lots of people who are important in your field of endeavor. 
you know, being at events is a great way to be inspired in a way that simply, you know, watching the videos that come out of conferences can't provide. You get the opportunity to hang out in the hallway track, to, to sit with friends and talk with them about the talks you've attended. That said, unlike basically everything in open source in free software, going to a conference costs money. Uh, if you don't live in the town where the conference is, you need to travel. If you live nearby, you need to stump up for registration costs, uh, parking or transport costs, and this can come on top of taking leave from your job, which you may not, uh, who may, if you may, uh, with an employer who doesn't support your attendance. So being able to provide the same sort of opportunities to everyone who wants to attend is what we call equity of access. Now conferences by default do not have equity of access. And inequity of access is a problem with diversity because the people who have barriers to attendance can't attend your conference. So the solution to this is to enthusiastically run outreach programs. So a lot of this talk, the rest of this talk, is going to be about money. Because with events, simply spending money in a targeted fashion can take care of all of these issues. If you target the right people, you can literally throw money at the problem without thinking beyond that targeting and still get a good result. Uh, you can compare this with things like the Summer of Code, uh, like Outreachy. These require significant labor on the part of the projects and the organizers of these outreach programs in order to get a single applicant to benefit. So really the trick with events is figuring out how to spend that money efficiently and effectively. So at PyCon Australia, uh, we've been running a successful outreach program uh, for the last five years, and I've been involved with most of those years. Uh, this talk is a case study in how we built up this program over five years, uh, what decisions we made in terms of building and growing this, um, growing this program, uh, what worked, what didn't, and how we're trying to make it better for the sixth year of this program, which will be happening in Melbourne later on. So when you consider FOSS events, you know, especially annual events like conferences, the period of engagement with your applicants and the signals of success uh, can be different to other outreach programs. So with events, it's really easy to define your goals for a funding program. Uh, you can think, for example, in terms of the number of new people you want to bring to an event. Uh, you can consider what demographics are underrepresented and that you can work on improving. Uh, you can think in terms of just the raw amount of money you want to spend. The other thing is that the period of engagement for a funding program for a conference is really well defined. Um, you want to get someone engaged before your conference happens so that they apply for your program, they attend your conference. And the other thing is that with events, if you run the event in a similar way year on year, uh, they tend to translate to a similar result year on year. And this replicability of events extends to the funding programs. If you run a funding program well, you'll tend to get the same result year on year. So the flip side is that with events, tracking the long-term benefits of your efforts is quite difficult. Uh, once the event is over, it's not immediately obvious whether you succeeded in a meaningful way that extends beyond your event. And in the case of PyCon events, we like for our recipients to engage with the Python community in some way. Um, there's lots of ways that people can start contributing, uh, be it through code contributions to open source, uh, or starting or speaking at user groups. Conferences are really only transient, but the engagement that your program runs will show up in unrelated places, and tracking that is quite difficult. Uh, so a bit about PyCon Australia itself. Uh, it's a regional edition of a global series of conferences. There are PyCons in about 30 different regions throughout the world now. Uh, in general, each of these PyCons are locally organized, and so whilst most of them get uh, sponsorship and grants, they're run independently of the Python Software Foundation. They're run independently of a mothership. Uh, basically, the only requirement from the PSF is that you have a code of conduct. Other than that, uh, organization is left pretty much to the local organizers. So PyCon Australia is one of the more established PyCons. It started with about 200 attendees back in 2010. Uh, in 2015, that number was finally doubled. Uh, PyCon Australia is the biggest PyCon within nine hours of flying. Um, and so far, we've run this event in three different cities with different volunteer-driven teams. This year, we're moving to our fourth city. We're moving to Melbourne. Uh, and it runs on weekends. 
and we run it on weekends because it makes it easier for enthusiasts and diversity uh, and, and students to, who can't uh, who can't get time off. It basically increases equity of access by default for as much of the conference as we can. Um, the biggest PyCon is PyCon US. PyCon US makes a really big deal about financial assistance. Uh, this year, sorry, last year in 2015, it spent more than $200,000 US in financial assistance. Um, PyCon US, however, is also a really, really big conference. They have a really big budget and they can spend commensurately more. Um, so looking at PyCon US as a case study might not be terribly useful to a small conference uh, that you might be planning on running yourself. Uh, PyCon Australia is much, much smaller, so looking at that might prove useful for building and growing something for smaller conferences. So in 2015, we had 450 attendees and we gave somewhere between 5 and 8% of our budget to funding, depending on how you track things. Now, the conference has two key parts, the first being standard presentations and tutorials type stuff. And then there are sprints, which is where you can work on open source projects in a guided fashion. You get a table, uh, you get people who are experienced in the project, and you can work on code for a couple of days. So we've had financial assistance running at PyCon Australia for the last five years. Uh, I was only directly in charge of the entire conference for two of those years. And for the other two events, I've run the financial assistance program within the context of someone else's vision for the conference, and more importantly, within some other treasurer's budgetary framework. So the main part of this talk is a retrospective on why we started offering a funding program and how this funding program has changed year upon year. So we start with 2011, which is the first time we ran a program like this. Uh, I wasn't closely involved with the conference at this point. Most of the financial assistance and, uh, and diversity efforts of 2011 was uh, led, by, led by Tim Ansell, uh, who is somewhere else at this conference. So give him, a, uh, give him congratulations if you see him. So between our first conference in 2010 and 2011, the mood around open source conferences really drastically changed. Uh, a whole series of events resulted in us sort of changing our outlook. Um, codes of conduct started to become a thing around late 2010, and uh, people at uh, 2011 will remember a certain keynote uh, incident. Um, it was pretty clear that our open source community was not doing things, uh, doing the right things for improving gender diversity. Um, PyCon Australia picked this up very, very quickly and basically adopted a policy for explicitly and directly improving gender diversity. And in doing so, the conference doubled the proportion of women attending the conference. And by actively going out and inviting women to speak, 20% of the speakers ended up being women, including two of the three keynotes, um, which was a pretty excellent first effort. Um, on the side of that, a code of conduct was adopted and grants were offered for improving gender diversity. So the first grant program that was run uh, was pretty simple. Um, it was intended to be funded entirely out of conference revenue. And basically how this worked was that people who wanted grants would send in their applications and these applications would be reviewed by a panel of anonymous reviewers. Uh, so two grants entirely funded out of conference uh, revenue. The problem is that seven applications were received and all of these were really, really strong. So running the program as intended would have resulted in turning away a majority of applicants, which is a problem for being inclusive. So when the program was being designed, which was about 60 days out from the conference, uh, the conference was drastically under, uh, under the expected number of attendees and drastically under projected revenue. Um, they intended to award the grants at 30 days out and they were still drastically under their attendance and revenue. Uh, you'll see that the attendance doubled in the, in the last month. Uh, this is what happens when you run conferences in Sydney. Um, so not enough money to, uh, to award grants to everyone. So how do you fix this? You find a corporate sponsor and you ask them to sponsor the program. Uh, luckily, one was found and they funded the entire program, including tickets for every genuine application, which is great. It meant that fi well, finding this like-minded partner, it was really important because it meant that everybody who wanted to attend could take part. It helped take a token contribution on the part of the organisers and it helped turn it into a big part of the conference and it was a big part in turning around the, uh, the attendance of uh, the proportion of women attending the conference. 
So in 2012, I took over uh, the organization of PyCon Australia along with uh, Josh Hesketh. Um, PyCon AU runs on a two-year rotation. So this is the first of two years that my team uh, ended up running the conference. This is where we try to basically embrace what the previous conference did and try to replicate what they did, get the same results so that we can extend it in the second year. But we were taking the conference outside of Sydney. Um, there's 4 million people in Sydney. Um, more than 50% of the conference attendees in 2010 and 2011 came from within the Sydney metropolitan area. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with how Australia works, uh, most of the financial industry in Australia is in Sydney. Most of the tech startups in Australia are in Sydney. It's just like you know, running out of San Francisco or New York if you're in, in the US. Um, you know, and Australia is basically the same size as America, with, but with one major difference. We're very, very sparse. It's difficult to road trip between cities. So if you want to plan any event with a national focus, you need to expect people to fly by, uh, to travel by air. Uh, one other difference between running in Sydney, we were moving it to Hobart, which is a city of... <laughs> Hobart is a city of 200,000 people. It's on an island in the middle of the Southern Ocean. We ran it in winter, so people probably didn't really want to attend on the basis of the weather. Um, there also really wasn't that much of a local tech community to sustain the event in the same way that Sydney's attendance, uh, Sydney's tech community could sustain PyCon Australia. So yeah, not really without its challenges. Uh, the good news is that we were able to retain our relationship with the sponsor that we took on. And because they had a positive experience the first year, um, they upped their sponsorship to $5,000. This let us fund travel accommodation registration up to $500 for 10 people. Uh, I'll be taking questions at the end, thank you. Um, so the program grew on 2011 and it allowed us to offer more meaningful grants to more people. Um, but as things start to become more popular and more noticeable, um, you start to get terrible people coming out of the woodwork. And you know, it's, it's fashionable to say don't feed the trolls, but realist, and, you know, realistically, terribly, terrible people aren't worth your time. But when you're a team of volunteers trying to run an event, wasting your time dealing with trolls is kind of awful. This sort of noise died out pretty quickly, but it was, it was still pretty frustrating. But there was other good stuff that happened to us as well, which is that our first financial aid recipient from 2011 came back to the conference, and she came back as a speaker. This, she was in a position to self-fund her trip from being a student the first year. So this is huge. It was, it was evidence that the program that we ran the first year was working. So in 2013 was a chance that my team got to extend the conference beyond what the first team got to do. Um, I personally got a chance to travel to PyCon US on the back of their financial assistance program and let me see what our bigger cousin did differently to what we did and also to meet people from the global Python community. And something we wanted to do was get people uh, from, in, uh, from other countries to attend our conference. Uh, we didn't have a speaker assistance program before 2013 and this meant that most of our speakers only came from Australia. And even when we offered free tickets to our speakers, our speakers were really only those who could afford to travel and speak at the conference. So bringing more people to what is in, es in essence a really remote conference was a big opportunity for us. So we restructured the program. Our sponsors stuck around for a third year and with their permission, we were able to do this restructuring. We basically followed PyCon US's model. They've been running financial aid for a lot longer than we have and their models seem fairly successful. So we just decided to enable this program uh, to support speakers as well as attendees. Some conferences run speaker support and financial assistance as separate things. Uh, LCA is such a conference. Uh, we ran them as the same budget pool with the same program with the same review process. And so basically what we did was we set an overall budget for financial assistance, but we removed the cap on individual grants. We would consider any reasonable requests for travel funding and accommodation. What this meant was that uh, people who are traveling shorter distances would get smaller grants, we'd have more budget to spend on people coming from internationally. Uh, the only requirement we kept on accommodation was that rooms were twin shared so as to make our accommodation dollar go as far as we possibly could. Uh, a bit more on that later. We also removed the, uh, the restriction on gender from our application process. 
Uh, the main reason for this was to enable a speaker funding program and you know, most of our speakers uh, were not women in this case. But it had the nice side effect of opening up our program to university students from interstate, to teachers, to people from geographically diverse backgrounds. And we ended up giving out $12,500 in funding. Uh, to put that in context to the rest of the conference, the conference budget in total was $120,000. So more than 10% of our budget went to financial assistance that year. One way we were able to do this, uh, when you consider that graph that I showed from 2011, one way we were able to, in, to do this was to offer our grants in a phased fashion. As we saw more revenue from registration, from sponsorship coming in, we started allocating grants to find, uh, our funds to financial assistance as a matter of preference. As we had more money to spend, as we were confident we would have more money to spend, we would allocate it to financial aid. But so the question that happens, that comes about when you remove this targeting of gender is what happens with diversity? So basically, rather than doing gender specific messaging ourselves, we reached out to groups that do uh, so such as the Pi Ladies movement, the Geek Girl Dinner groups uh, from interstate, uh, university student societies to work on targeting for us. Uh, these sorts of groups already have networks of people who make great candidates. Uh, it means we don't have to duplicate work in finding great people to apply to our program. Um, the applicants in 2013 improved drastically in quality because we had groups going out and targeting people on our behalf rather than us trying to do targeting. And at the same time, because we weren't doing that messaging, we stopped getting concern trolled so the volunteers didn't have to deal with terrible communications. And we were still able to give about 50% of our funds to women. Um, once we stopped thinking about the raw number of grants, it also became much easier to think about you know, giving free tickets to local students, people like that, um, because we had you know, relatively small amounts left over that we can just throw at tickets. It was great. Um, and so even though 20% of our overall delegates were women, we were still giving out half of our financial aid budget to women, which meant, that we, which meant that we were granting well in excess of the rest of the conference cohort. So I still consider that a success. Now, opening up the applications also started to allow us to bring in university students from interstate, as well as high school computer science teachers and students. So enthusiastic students and teachers are often force multipliers for conferences because they can come to your conference, learn a whole bunch of stuff, go back home and be really, really enthusiastic about it. Uh, we also got speakers from Asia who were able to attend on our grant. So we were increasing the geographic reach of our conference as well. So in 2014, the main thing that happened to us was a loss of sponsorship, um, spoilers. Um, this didn't happen for any malice. Um, basically, the contact that we had at our first sponsor uh, had moved on and the person who replaced them uh, wasn't really as passionate about our conference as the per previous person was. These sorts of things happen when you run conferences. You need to plan for contingencies. Um, so the original program that we had with our sponsor was $5,000 and the conference figured out how to spend an extra $7,500 on top of that in 2013. Um, if we'd just been spending $5,000, we probably could have been able to fund the program ourselves out of conference budget. Running a $12,000 program on a budget of that scale is much, much harder to justify. So we had a question, would we try and uh, step back and run a smaller scale program in 2014, or would we, would we branch out and find other sources of funding? So PyCon US has a long-standing tradition of getting everybody who attends the conference to pay for the conference. Uh, this includes speakers, this includes the volunteers, this includes the core organizers. Now these days, this is justified by way of their financial assistance program. Uh, Jesse Nola's essay, Everybody Pays, is a really, really good guide on why they do this. It explains it far better than I could. Uh, but in short, it's a strong value judgment on the part of PyCon, which is that making the conference inclusive and accessible to everyone is more important than going out of your way to make your speakers feel ultra special. Um, PyCon AU hadn't gone down this road before. So the main argument in favor of making sure that, it, or of making everyone pay is that these days, most speakers who work in open source, who work in free software, aren't doing so as hobbyists. Uh, Python is no exception. 
And also in Australia, people who self-fund conference tip, uh, trips have quite decent tax incentives to attend. So this is the main argument in favour of getting everyone to pay. We assume that most of our speakers are in a position to claim their registration as a business expense or as a tax deduction. Um, so the arguments against that is that offering complimentary registration is often seen as recognition or payment in kind for the work that they do. Um, and even worse, there are conferences who make every single speaker pay regardless of their ability to pay. And this sort of thing is rightly criticised. Um, in the absence of anything else, I tend to agree that getting everyone to pay is a really bad idea. Um, because it means that there becomes a certain amount of privilege that is required in order to speak at a conference, which is not something that you want to do. So here's what we did with PyCon Australia. We told speakers when, they, when we accepted their talk that by default they would be charged for their attendance, but they could reply to the email that we sent to them and we would waive their cost. We also had the policy of offsetting every dollar raised from speaker assistance or speaker registrations to financial assistance. In return, we would enthusiastically prioritise speakers for financial aid. We almost never turn down a speaker's expense applications. I'll let Martin get that photo and then I'll move on. Um, the key to making this work is two things. The first is to waive the cost without exception. That's a positive experience for a speaker and it shows that we value the needs of the speaker. It also, it's also really not worth your while as a conference organiser to argue with a speaker, as it will probably not make them enjoy the event. Speakers are really, really valuable voices in your community. The more they say in your favour as an organiser, the better. The second is that everyone should pay. Given that we started asking our presenters to pay, we adopted the same policy for our conference organisers. Everyone from the core team, from the lead organiser down, including myself, uh, paid for their ticket to attend in 2014. The result of that, we didn't just recover the shortfall from losing our sponsorship, we exceeded it. Now when you consider that we no longer need to sink the costs from free tickets from speakers, the overall effect on the budget was more in the order of ten dollars to $11,000. So it basically made up the amount of money that we'd spent in 2013 from having a sponsor. So the result of this experiment is that we have a reliable stream of income that is repeatable year upon year, and it means that our, we can continue to run this funding program without needing to worry about where the money comes from. So, in 2014, we stumbled upon this method of funding the thing. It proved repeatable in 2015. I'm not going to be dwelling on that anymore. When I talk about making a program like this sustainable, there's another thing to consider. This is a volunteer-run event. It's really important to make sure things like this are easy to run because it's an important factor in reducing the burnout of your volunteers, making the thing um, repeatable. So in running a program like this, there are some things that you need to do. You need to take applications somehow and you need to assess those applications. There are other things that we as organisers brought upon ourselves that weren't strictly necessary. Things like uh, coordinating room shares at hotels. Uh, categorising and verifying the, the sorts of expenses that our applicants sent in with their receipts. These things were generally unnecessary. So in 2015, we stopped considering travel reimbursements and accommodation expenses separately. Instead, uh, we as the, uh, as the financial aid review team calculated what we thought would be a reasonable amount for their needs and just said, spend less than, spend up to this amount. And then we awarded that amount overall. This approach worked really, really well. It meant that we as organisers didn't need to go booking hotel rooms for our, our uh, financial aid recipients. And it turns out that enthusiastic recipients of financial aid are more than happy to work to find good value in their accommodation dollar. Uh, people will find their friends and find Airbnb apartments to share. Uh, people will take slightly cheaper hotel rooms a bit of a walk away from the venue rather than staying at the conference hotel. And even better, removing the hard cap on accommodation costs means that people who have special needs, you know, such as you know, increased privacy or stuff like that, their needs are better catered for. Um, when I attended PyCon US in 2013, I room shared with a stranger. It was a wonderful experience, but this is not likely, this is not going to be the same result for everyone. Not everyone's going to have a positive experience like this. 
Another thing we did in 2015 was run a day for people working in education. Uh, this was great for us because it increased the number of teachers who came along to the main part of the conference. Uh, thanks to Nick Coglin, who worked with the Python Software Foundation, uh, we introduced a pilot financial assistance program for teachers. So as well as covering costs for travel or for people at, from out of town, we sought to solve an interesting issue that happened with teachers. Many schools have professional development budgets for teachers and our event is definitely applicable as professional development. So registration, travel costs, not an issue. Schools have budgets. But bizarrely, the cost of substitute teachers generally aren't considered in this. So teachers can only really do training during school holidays. So a way to make the conference more accessible to teachers was to offer to underwrite the cost of substitute teachers for the schools. This would mean that teachers could attend the conference during school term. Um, an interesting problem, one that we hadn't considered running, uh, that we hadn't considered beforehand. So earlier I talked, to, talked about it being difficult to judge the overall performance of what we do. Uh, here's some definite results uh, that I've observed while running this program over the years. Every year since 2012, we've had a past funding recipient return to the conference as a speaker. They've become sufficiently skilled in Python to submit talks and get their talk independently accepted by the review team. That's really, really cool. We're increasing the pool of speakers. We're making our event better by investing in previous years. Past funding recipients are often really, really grateful for their opportunities and become enthusiastic advocates for what we do running a conference. Very often, uh, applicants in subsequent years thank friends who've received funding um, for pointing them at the application process uh, in the past. Finally, we see uh, people who've participated in our event come back once they're in the workforce, paying their way as professional attendees. And they often cite their participation in our conference as their reason for staying in tech, and even better, for seeking out jobs that let them do Python in their day-to-day -day life, which is fantastic. So we finish with a grab bag of things that we've discovered over the last few years of running this thing. The first is that being open to everyone means that unexpected groups of people can apply to your program. In 2013, we found it much, much more effective to get special interest groups to do special interest marketing for us. So we were able to keep targeting the groups that we had previously done less good targeting for on our own, but got people experience to do that targeting for us. But it also let unexpected groups apply, such as people from geographic areas that we didn't expect. So if you're trying to enable an, in, an improvement in diversity at an event, it's important not to offer solutions in a sort of cookie cutter style because diverse people have diverse access issues to conferences. Uh, and being flexible enough to accommodate those diverse access issues is really, really, really important. Relatedly, offering a rigid set of, of grant types has proved to be quite discouraging for people. So when you give applicants just an amount to spend and let them spend it how they wish, there's often a lot less work for volunteers. Uh, nobody likes categorizing expenses. Don't inflict doing re expense reports upon your volunteers. That's a really silly thing to do. Um, it also makes the task of, of running a grants program much, much easier to reproduce. And also handling ad hoc funding requests means that it's much, much easier to handle unusual requests, um, unusual accommodation needs that can arise from physical or from mental disability, um, improving disabled access for people who we haven't already catered for, or enabling things for whom travel is not an issue. Uh, our program in 2016 is likely to be an ad hoc style funding program rather than one that offers flights and accommodation as specific grant types. Um, Finding sponsors can make bootstrapping programs like this much, much easier than going out and doing it out of conference revenue. Uh, so look for like-minded companies who publicly support diversity in tech. You can generally find those because they're loud about it. Find out what sort of things they're willing to put their money towards and work with them to run the sort of program that they would be happy to support. This may mean that you can't run the exact sort of program that you want to run from up front. But it's still a great way to start a program up while you diversify your funding sources and then run the program that you want to run a few years later on. 
Now, as with any sort of effort like this, expecting 100% of your grant recipients to go out, be speakers, be open source contributors, stuff like that, it's just not reasonable. In general, people are really, really grateful to pay it forward. Some people might just fall off the radar. Some people might be genuinely terrible and prove themselves to not be deserving of your grants. Accept that this will be a result. Accept that people coming out of your pro having some people coming out of your program and doing great things is the result you want. And you'll be much, much happier and less upset with yourself about the results that you have. So I stole this idea from PyCon US's current financial assistance chair. Budgeting 50% more than you intend to spend makes it much, much easier to give out grants to everyone you want to give grants to. Um, if you have a $5,000 headroom in your budget, Offering an extra $500 towards some grant for somebody from overseas is not going to push you over budget. You're much more likely to accept it. It means you can also handle unexpected blowouts in individuals' requests compassionately. And you can also handle last minute grant requests. So for example, speakers who lose the support of their employer, you can get them to the conference without needing to stress about your budget. Really, really important. Now, most applications to these programs tend to be genuine. If you're in a well-off country, uh, you may get one or two people who are doing immigration scams. Um, that's really, really annoying. <laughs> um, you, yeah, immigration scams are also really, really annoying. Um, <laughs> People will, try to get, people will try to get you to trick, them, trick you into writing out a visa application for them. But you know, generally, there are people from Africa, from Asia, who are really genuine applications who you can verify who deserve to come along. But they're also really, really expensive to bring along. If you can't award grants to them, when you decline them, you make sure you take your time to write a letter explaining why they were declined and perhaps point them in the direction of a local conference. PyCon is great because there's 30 of them. There's conferences basically everywhere on every continent. You can point them towards something that they might actually be able to afford. And you can spend more money uh, on your own conference, bringing more local people and making, the benefit, making more local people benefit. Uh, so here's a list of, of resources that I referred to during this talk. Um, Jesse Nola's piece on why everyone pays for PyCon US was a really useful thing. Um, LVH's bit about how to run the PyCon US financial aid program was also really good. Um, I'm also really interested in doing t-shirts right at conferences. You should ask me about that at some point. I didn't have time to talk about it today. And programs like this um, take a lot of effort from lots and lots of people. Um, both reviewers, people who've run the conferences beforehand, and people who, um, who basically got this stuff starting. They've been a a great help in running this. It wasn't just my own doing here. Uh, and with that, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Mm. Oh, Benno, do you have a question? I have a question. <laughs> mm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question. Uh, um, Are what, you going to ask it? What, what, uh, what subset of this do you know may or may not be available for LCA 2017? Um, I suspect that we would be running a similar sort of, um, a similar sort of program. We would probably need to so uh, seek out sponsors for it at the moment. Um, our budget is tight for various reasons. Um, LCA runs a separate speaker fund, and it might be difficult to dismantle that and tie it into general financial aid. That's a question that we would need to revisit as a team. Um, once again, I don't speak for the entire LCA 2017 team. So you mentioned uh, holding the conference on a weekend to increase access for hobbyists. And